I want to talk a little bit today about you know, digital transformation, big data. What, is, what does this mean? I mean, fundamentally, our industry, whatever industry you're in, frankly, is just changing dramatically. From when I've started in GIS, let's just say a, a little while back, to now, what we expect people to do is completely different. It's no longer about taking, moving from a paper clipboard and putting it on a map, although some of that's still in existence. It's really about going forward. How do you transform the rest of the organization? How do you use data? How do you bring this digital twin idea to life and transform how, how your business actually works? It's not just about data, it's about taking action. So I'd like to ask Danny to talk a little bit about the vision around the digital twin in this world. Thanks, Damien. You know, we spent a lot of time this morning talking about this concept of a digital twin. And the interesting thing about being a GIS professional is, is that normally you would think that GIS is at the center of that twin model. And as we think about this a little bit, it's not so much that GIS is at the center of this, it's that the location, intelligence, and information that you need plays a part or a role in just about every aspect of the twin. And if you think about the presentations that you've seen this morning, starting at the top of this circle, most of this has revolved around thinking about the data, the system of record that all of you created. And as you move around the circle, you've seen a lot of things about how we've enabled different applications and different devices to see that content. And as you heard from Chevron and others today, you talked about how their next strategy or next move was into mobile and then to imagery and then into IoT and then into analytics. It's a maturity model that we've seen for a long time. What's changing though is that people want to take that context of the data and start doing analytics within your organization. Whether that's through data scientists or other departments, they want to actually take the content and do analytics on that information and then visualize it. The thing that you really need to start thinking about as you go through the rest of this week and get back into your roles is that being a part of this digital transformation is what you've all been doing. You've been innovating on how you give access to content and at the same time, we're driving analytics to get better business results. And to me, Damien, this is a key message that we wanted to get across this week is because they're gonna play such a big role. But the thing that's interesting is that for most people here, you probably have thought that we've been doing big data for a long time and been doing analytics. I mean, do you think the industry is changing or that they're really catching up to what we've been doing? Well, fundamentally, the whole idea of big data, for some of us 10, 15 years ago, we thought we were doing big data. I remember having conversations with some of you on Seismic 15, 20 years ago, that was big data. The biggest data we have at any one point is big data. Let's just acknowledge that. Everything you think of big data today in 10 years is going to fit on your phone. What you need to think about is what is big data? Well, let's be honest. Big data is often overhyped and probably the most misunderstood term we have out there. People generally say big data. Well, we have a big data problem. Well, big data actually means a couple different things. And I think it's really good for us just to make sure we understand when we're talking among ourselves, we bring that back to our own industries. What do we mean? Right? There's big data, and there's the big data analytics. Functionally, big data is collecting, storing, retrieving massive collections of observations, data recordings. This is geospatial, this is business, this is every bit of data you've ever had. Long gone are the days where, well, we've got new data, let's throw away the old data. Stop that if there's anyone in your organization still doing that. Big data many times is actually just accumulations. Taking all your data that you've had, storing it, and then starting to look at it. Big data itself challenges IT because of the data volume and the data velocity. There's a lot of data, it's coming fast, how do they deal with it? But when you look at big data analytics, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's actually doing something with that pile of data. Allowing the data to be visualized, to be analyzed, to be modeled, and ultimately using it to be able to be predicted. But this has a different set of challenges. 
right? This is for the analysts. This is about how do I deal with all these different types of data? I don't have one data stream anymore to base on. But also on the veracity of the data, the truthfulness. As you get more and more data from different sensors, from different individuals, from the outside public, how well do you trust the data? What's the metadata? Oh, scary term. About each of your data elements, how well can you trust it? IT, they're not out of the game yet because they actually have to make it available to be processed, used, and do the analysis on top of it that the analysts want to be able to use. But when this comes together, our fundamental understanding of the data we already have is being challenged. Because we're looking at this pile of information and understanding new things. Some of it is actually things that we've known. But we've known by intuition and by the experts in the field who've been there long enough that you always know if something goes wrong, go ask Alice. Alice will know what to do. Well, Alice has a great memory and a good analysis skills. And Alice has taken all her years of wisdom and said, yeah, you should do X. By the way, if you've ever encountered this, Alice probably will retire in the next year. What are you going to do then? And how do you get your managers to be able to understand you're saying do X and you're not going on a gut feeling. You're going on science. You're going on your models. And that's where the big data comes together. It actually changes how we think and we act when we start looking at this data. Whether it's situational awareness and decision support, or it's on pattern detection and analysis. Both these areas, mapping and geography, are fundamental. And I don't think we've had a time in our careers where they have not, they've never been as important as they are now to bring this data together. So I want to talk a little bit about some examples of how these things can come together. Some of them are obvious, providing a situational awareness when looking at a field. What's going on? It's not a paper report. It's a visualization. It's easy to understand. It's bringing together lots of disparate information. But what about situational awareness at an event, like the Super Bowl? Super Bowl this last year brought together thousands of layers of information, thousands of live feeds, all into a centralized command, as well as mobile units. What brought them all together? Geospatial. Everything had a place. They had other information that was non-spatial that they started to try to relate to spatial, provide operational awareness. This was not something they said, oh, yeah, let's turn this on today. They built hundreds of layers before the event, so they had operational readiness going in. At the Chicago Marathon, they're doing the same, but they're also including more citizen input to be able to allow citizens to say, this, hey, this is what's going on here. This is what I see. To be able to put another sensor feed into their network. These are big data problems. These are situational awareness problems. These are, frankly, your everyday problems. But you can also look at situational awareness at looking at patterns and detection. This is a street map for Moscow. Everybody's now going, Moscow, what's, what's the red box mean? What's this? It's aggregating traffic patterns. You're looking for anomalies. To be able to detect anomalies, what do you need? You need history. More history, better ideas of whether it's really anomalous. Is it Tuesday afternoon every Tuesday? There's an event that happens, so don't worry about it if it looks like that if it's Tuesday. But if it looks like that and it's Thursday, worry about it. It's bringing together that data into patterns and analysis and not just individual points, but aggregating it so you can do analysis. Being able to pull in thousands and tens of thousands and millions, and in your world, billions of individual points and start to make some sense out of them. Start to understand, is there a pattern here? What do we see? So this is, unfortunately, fatal accidents around the US. Where are they clustered? What time of day did they occur? What's the weather? What was involved? What type of vehicle? 
frankly, we, looking at this data, there was some really interesting stuff. Thankfully, most local municipalities are dealing with this themselves right now. They look at this. Very few people look at it at a national scale and say, huh, oh, New Jersey is like North Carolina, and Central Valley, California is similar. Maybe they should be sharing information. It's not just about finding the patterns. It's about identifying what you're going to do next. And things move. Things move all the time. But how do they move? Where do they move? What does it mean? What's the heat surface for movement? Whether it's in your facility, on your campus, across your field, how are people moving? Can you reconstruct that? Can you see the pattern? Can you see when they deviate from their norm? Can you help build new information based on their routes? Why did, there's a road here, why do they never go there? Oh, there's a lock gate, or it's muddy, or... So all your other assumptions have to be relooked at. But the best big data is not stuff that's just done by data scientists in the background and for a one-use project. It's building information products that everybody in the organization can then use. So this is what's called a pattern of life analysis. This is looking at taxi cabs in New York City. Did they pay cash? Did they pay credit? That tells you a lot about your potential consumers. This is, yeah, a few hundred million transactions. But it's now actually usable. I can start to make business decisions based on this information. This actually tells you, this is really interesting, it tells you, did, were they, did they pay more to pick you up? Or did they pay more to tip you to get, go, get you where they're going? Sociologists use this to say kind of, were they happy to leave or were they happy to arrive? Again, this is useful. This is tons and tons of data pulled together. The, but the people who use this, like in your organizations, will have no big data knowledge. They're using it to make a decision. Big data, big data analytics, is a commodity that you need to provide to the rest of the organization so that they make decisions based on the information surface that you provide. This one's a little more local. These are power outages in Houston over a 10-year period. Now you might say, well, yeah, well, why is, my power doesn't go out that much. These are everything from a flicker all the way to, yeah, we, somebody took down a pole. But what it looks like is there are patterns, but they change over time. So what you see in the lower right is a 3D or 4D cube of the data. So you can look at hot spots and cool spots of the data over time to see how it changes. What does this mean? Being able to bring all this information allows the executives to start to say, okay, well, we have a pattern. We have a new pattern here. Previously, you would have asked Bob down the hall, hey, why is the power always going out in the Northwest? Oh, those, those are a bunch of poles that they fail a lot. So yeah, we gotta replace them every couple of years. Now, as Bob retires in two weeks, you can operationalize that. You can actually start to ask those questions. But it moves beyond traditional. As people move into using the Internet of Things, IoT sensors, the web-enabled world, we're seeing customers actually start to implement IoT across their own transit networks. Be able to look at the rail line, to look at the sensors on the rail, on the tracks, on the cars, on the couplings, on the brakes, to be able to correlate that on the map to events, to stream flow, to weather, to temperature, and be able to start to predict when they might have equipment failure. Because in this case, if the equipment fails, the time down is real money. The line's not running, the product is not moving, it's gonna cost real dollars, and it's gonna get real expensive, real fast. So if you can delay a train by 20 minutes to replace something earlier, or cancel one train with planning, they're all for it. And in this world, we're seeing this more and more. Our partners at Snyder Electric and Microsoft are working together to build an IoT on the wellheads. To be able to say, well, you know, this doesn't look quite right. Maybe we should alter how it's performing, or maybe we should shut it down until we get a crew out there. 
but that's bringing in all the sensors, all the IoT platform, bringing in all the information and building this data cube to, that you can sort and look through and start to understand. Yes, you can use it to react to immediately, but the big value comes in over time as you build that information, you can start to understand how it changes. And when you look at big data, big data analytics, you have to think locally as well and other sensors. This was a snapshot from a couple weeks ago where people actually reporting through social media if they got the cold, if they got the bug that's going around, and be able to understand what's happening in your community. All the information that your organization used 20 years ago, most of it came in-house. 20 years from now, most of the information will come from various sensors that you don't own. We're in a transition period. You need to understand how to start to bring in these other feeds of information. Now, some of you are probably thinking, yeah, yeah, I don't deal with big data. That's those other guys who do the special analytics. Yeah, that's the case today. It's not the case in the future. The reality is every aspect of your organization will be using spatial, big data analytics, and artificial intelligence. Because spatially enabled big data analytics actually provides the context for pretty much everything your business does. And as we look forward, it becomes the basis for everything that we do as well. So what's next? Obviously, you know, I believe that your business demands analytics. We absolutely know it demands innovation. Big data is already here. This is not a future state. Start small, start using data. It sounds odd to say start small with big data. Start with a big data, but find a project, do it. Get your feet wet, start answering some questions. Start, don't think it's gonna change the world and you're gonna have some insight nobody's ever heard of, although it might, but start on a, a data set where you can say, okay, this can help me. But I'm gonna challenge you to reimagine the ArcGIS platform. It's not just about GIS anymore. It's about analytics. It's about communication. It's about bringing this data together, sharing it, and making it available. We here at Esri are here to help. Sessions this week, people here to talk to, but of course, anything that you need back in your offices to help you deliver a, a proof of concept to show how geospatial and big data work together, we're happy to help. We really believe that through this work, we can enable digital transformation in your organizations with geospatial innovation.